If you are not in control of your income and somebody else or some other thing is, then you lose the ability to make clear headed decisions. Welcome to the Unstoppables. I'm Bill Woodich, and you're on the station, the channel, the network. It's going to turn those ideas you have, the intentions, you know, the I wish I could have, into the motivation, the tactics, the strategies, and the way to move forward. Today, it's my friend and guest, Sean Crabtree. He's from the Crabtree Group. Am I correct, Sean? That's right. That's right. How you doing, Bill? And he, I'm doing great. And he is, he's located right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. In football, he's a Tennessee Titans fan. I know this because I spent some time talking with Sean. <laughs> and, and you know what I got to tell you, man? I'm loving, loving the outfit. That red is popping at me. Okay. Listen, I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to take my cues from who is the best dressed man uh, <laughs> in media. And, uh, and look at you. Look at you, man. I, you, are the, you are the guy. You know, I'm going to take that and send it out there, okay? And you know, <laughs> you look, you're looking really good. Sean, I, I, I can do this, and I can I cannot do it as well as you. But give me a 30,000-foot perspective and give the audience some insight into what it is you do and why you'd be of value to them. Well, you know, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, uh, to tell that story. I mean, we are, we are business strategists, um, and that's what we do. Uh, in short, what we do is find out as much as we can about who it is, how it is, what it is, where it is, when it is that, uh, that you want to be uh, in your business. And then we find out as much as we can about where it is that you currently are. And then we help you develop strategies from, to get you from point A to point B. Everybody wants something different, right? Everybody's in a different place. Um, and so again, we, we spend a lot of time finding out as much as we can about those two items. And then we help implement strategies to get you from point A to point B. And if it feels like a good relationship for us, if it feels like a good relationship for you, then we hold your hand and push you and pull you and drag you and hug you and kick you and whatever it takes to make sure that those strategies are implemented on an hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. We're very good at what we do. Um, our guys will grow about 48% in terms of production and collection. Um, I've worked with, with groups from Vancouver, British Columbia to Barbados from uh, Nassau in the Bahamas to uh, Edmonton, Alberta. How's yeah. that? I've never been in Eastern Canada. I don't know why. Maybe they don't like me up there. I don't know. I bet they loved your accent, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because listen, I, for the first, probably, uh, probably 10 years that I was traveling, I was just a maniac, man. I'm 210 days a year speaking and, you know, working somewhere and, uh, and everybody, when they, when they hear my accent, they'd go, Oh, you know, they'd say something like uh, Jack Daniels or, or Johnny Cash. Right. And I thought, you know, I was never a country music fan and I never really drank Jack Daniels. But after all these years, I thought maybe I ought to check out this country thing and maybe I ought to start drinking Jack Daniels. I don't know. I'll tell you what, Sean, you start drinking Jack Daniels, you're going to sound like Johnny Cash. <laughs> it's kind of part of the deal. At least to myself. Right. Let me drop, let me come around full circle on just something that's so outside, but this, this will, you're, you're taking me in this direction, which is what, okay. I, which is what I love. We were in Vegas for 10X, so my assistant, Kelsey, is a big-time hockey fan. She drags me, I wasn't kicking, wasn't screaming, to a game with a, with a new team, the Golden Knights of Vegas, right? Right. And we end up on the Jack Daniels suite <laughs> lounge with a statue of old Jack sitting there on the bench. I took a picture with him. I said, man, he caused me a lot of headaches, but who's laughing now? That's, <laughs> story. That's what I have. I, I remember him. He's my initiation from in the, into college. Woo. I don't know, that's why I don't remember it. it give me a, a type if there is one. And I know this, this could be a, a, a number of businesses, but give me your ideal business. Uh, give me a profile. A profile of the ideal business that we would like to work with? Yes. You know, that's a great question. I've been asked that question uh, a lot. Uh, I think people tend to believe that there's some sort of a, 
you know, you guys work with only the, the multi-million dollar companies or, or that kind of thing. And I think, I think there's a little bit of truth to that. I mean, um, guys that, are, that, that have a lot of things going well already tend to be thinking differently. You understand that. I mean, in the work that you do, um, in the book that you've written and the books that you have coming up, I mean, you, you get that. We're really looking for somebody who is thinking a little bit uh, outside of the box. The real trick for us is we're looking for somebody who's not holding themselves back. They're always learning. They're always forward, as you say. They're always um, Thank you. They're always willing to look inward. Yeah. And I think that's really the, the real trick. Um, I've learned over the years that whether you're talking about financial freedom, you're talking about business, uh, frankly, whether you're talking about life, it has – a hundred percent to do with what's going on right here and very little to do with anything else. Um, I think it was Zig Ziglar that, that talked about, you know, it works like this, be, do, have, yeah. whatever you do comes from what's going on right here. Absolutely. And so that's, you know, that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. As I said, we're business strategists. So it's all about the strategy. Um, you know, not to go long on this, but, you know, Bill, we find that, that, you know, you, you're the, the, the goal of, of your, um, of your show here is intentions mm -hmm. basically into dollars, right? Mm -hmm. We find that so many things that go on in business are unintentional. They are, mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what we call tactical, mm -hmm. they're technical in nature. And if you stop and you think a little bit, you can put a strategy in place so that that thing is not checking off on a to-do list. It's serving a bigger place that you're trying to go. And you've got a strategy that's based in that intention. And now the things that you do are coming from a right, the right basis. If that makes any sense. So then it comes down to an alignment with tactics that, that are a part and parcel of the strategy, the overarching strategies. And then it's all about the execution of those tactics, which your holding people accountable. You're, correct? That's it. I mean, it is, it is accountability. You know, it's, it's, it's step one. Um, you know, this may sound crazy, but you've experienced this. There are a lot of guys out there who have great businesses and they really have no direction in terms of no long-term place that they're trying to get to before we start implementing strategies. And before we start laying out tactics that go along with those strategies, we got to first tie into who the heck is it that you want to be? How quickly do you want to be there? What is it all based in? And then from there, strategies and then tactics. You know, Kelsey, I really like this guy. So I just want to tell you, I really, I really like you. I, 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 like, I like, and what you're saying reminds me of, of Yogi Berra, who said in, in baseball, he said, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just going in circles. But you said a key thing, Sean, and I don't want the audience to miss this. A key, key thing, and it has everything to do with ego. And you talked about looking inward and being able to really honestly, as much as you can, as a human, honestly assess where are my deficiencies? You know, where's my vitamin D in here? Where do I need a vitamin D shot? Because I got a deficiency here. And really being able to- Yeah, we to, all have them. Oh, oh, uh, uh, none more, <laughs> more so than me. I just kind of camouflage it with what I wear. Right. So, <laughs> you know, substance style, style, substance, whatever. Just confuse it a little bit. But that deficiency and being able to look inward and say, okay, I need someone like Sean to give me that, that punch, that direction, the other idea, maybe break down the barriers of the box. And, and I think it's part of your nature. I'm making an assumption here. That you're really in this thing more so than the money just to really get that kick out of helping people. It, it, like and, and that's a good way to put it. And that's the way I describe it, actually. It is a kick in the pants. Um, you know, I, I mean, honestly, Bill, you know what? I, when people ask me what I do and I, and I go into the description of what I do, uh, I liken it, honestly, to one of my favorite things on earth that I did for many, many years uh, when I was in college. And that was uh, coaching Little League. It's a lot like coaching literally because you, you take these guys that they're not working together. They, they don't really know what they're capable of. Right. But you have them begin to see what the possibilities are. And then you have them get into places where they're achieving things that they never realized was possible. And, and I'm telling you, that's, that's what I've been doing for the last 21 years. And I, and I do get a kick out of it. 
You know, I was telling someone this the other day, there's been a new sales rep in, in one of the companies, the Woodage Group, who, who sold something, just crushed it. And I got a bigger high, and I was telling someone, I got a bigger high and a bigger lift than when I used to do it. Because I love watching that development and I love seeing that coaching because all mentorship is, is coaching. Yeah. So, you know, in that mentorship, that coaching, that strategic overlay like you do with the tactical application and man, when that affects the ultimate, their lifestyle, where they have more lifestyle, you know, they have different lifestyle options and they open up the door to more. And that's about, to me, it's personal. It's about creating family values. It's about being able to export those values through a higher standard of living. That's it. It's not about the excess greed. It's about that for me. So yeah, yeah. You, we're talking about little league. We're talking about college. So <laughs> tell me how you got started in your in, we're all over the board here, man. Well, we're supposed to be all over the board because this is my show. We're going to all the board because you, you and I cannot stay on the board. We don't like boxes. Break them. We don't need no stinking boxes. We just go. Right. This is the board. That's right. So tell me how you got started. You know, I, I've got an interesting story. I, um, right out of college, I, I got into the telecommunications industry. But we're talking, the, we're talking the early days here, Bill. It wasn't even called telecommunications at the time. It was called cellular telephony. Um, I, I started to work with a, yeah, I started to work with a, uh, a franchise group. There were literally about six of us who made all the decisions, uh, around the table. And, um, you know, it was, it was a dream job for me. I mean, it was technology that nobody had heard of. Uh, I learned so much in that decade, um, as the industry matured, you know, we kept getting bought out and we kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, I let, when I left, they were GTE mobile net. When I started, there were six of us. When I left, they were owned by GTE mobile net. There were 675,000 people worldwide that they employed. And then about two weeks after I left, Verizon uh, bought that company, but it was a really unique perspective. I was in every imaginable industry um, all over the place uh, dealing with small, large and medium size, CEOs. Uh, I got an opportunity. I had to, I mean, I had to learn the business and where the challenges were in all of those dis different industries to be able to, um, you know, help them out with the technology that we had. But I don't want to get too far down that, down that road. Um, one of my clients uh, actually was in dentistry and I didn't really understand what he did. Uh, he worked with a guy named Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And he recruited me to kind of look behind the curtains at what it is that these guys did over there. And what I found was, you know, at the time, everybody I met, there were 675,000 people that worked at this company and everybody I met knew the basics of, let's say, sales, right? The, you know, I was a trainer. I was a commercial account executive and a trainer within that company for sales training as well. And, and everybody I met knew the basics of training. When I, when I looked behind the curtain into healthcare, I was amazed that, uh, you know, nobody really understood the concepts of influence and sales and creating value and all of these kinds of things. And for a young guy who was 10 years out, that was attractive, man. I mean, I came to a planet where basically, uh, you know, I was an alien and, and I knew stuff that nobody else knew. And that was very attractive. And that's, that's really how I got into um, healthcare. And then from there it branched because I learned that the concepts, I guess in a lot of ways I was in my own bubble. Uh, I thought everybody understood sort of the general basics of strategies, sales, communication, leadership, all of the things, right, that you have to have as an entrepreneur. And uh, I realized that that was not the case. And so I'll make it quick. For the first probably uh, 10 years, I totally jumped ship out of that uh, industry into this industry. And I became a business strategist. And for probably 10 years, anybody that would uh, literally pay me, Mm -hmm. um, I was on a plane and I was gone to the tune of about 205 or 10 days a year. I was in some part uh, of the world. You're like George Clooney up in the air, huh? You know, I, I've, my wife has compared me to Clooney in that 
in that movie, at least on the travel part, you know, with the, where he gets the card, you know, the, the million mile travel car, man, I was that way. And I learned, um, I was, I was through, through some different things. I learned that the old adage about uh, taking the horse to water and making him drink are two different things. Uh, absolutely. You know what yeah. I say? There's, there's a third part to that. I learned that? People. You got not only lead him to the water, stick the head in, Got to kick it in the stomach to make sure it opens his mouth. <laughs> yeah, any shot of it, uh, I got to give you another aside. Matt Crane's on here and he says he loves the tower behind Sean. Tell you, oh. it's becoming all about you. Oh. He loves that southern gunslinger, like kind of type accent you got. I told you you were out dressing me. Listen, but Matt, then, Matt. But Matt, Matt comes back and says that but, but Bill's the best dressed interviewer on the planet. The, the, you know what? I, I don't the disagree not, with any of that. <laughs> He separated, and, uh, and Matt's gonna have to give me give me his address so I can send him some money. <laughs> hey, you know the uh, this is the Nashville skyline, by the way, and the tower back there is uh, they call that the Batman Tower. That's the Bell Center building in Nashville. Yeah. Now you don't tell anybody that the initials B W Bruce Wayne Bill Woodich are. Is that, is that a coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. So Batman is my favorite superhero. I'll just come out and tell you that. Am I Batman? <laughs> That'll be another discussion. But <laughs> we'll hold that for later. I didn't mean to digress and go all over the board because as we understand with you and I, there are no parameters. We're just going. And, and you I, and I have a good time every time we're together. I can just keep listening to your accent. So <laughs> keep going, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just saying, what you, you know, I haven't thought about that, by the way, just to bring it back. I mean, kicking him your in the Your accent stomach. or Batman? I should have. <laughs> kicking the horse in the stomach is something I should have done. Boom. That, there you go. <laughs> that opens the mouth. Yeah, yeah. And then, and only then, do you have a shot. That's right. <laughs> oh. Kelsey, you got a really man over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Now, Matt says he's down right down the street from you in Pulaski, Tennessee. Is, is there a place called Pulaski, Tennessee? No kidding. Oh, absolutely. Boy, yeah, great, 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 great town. The bromance going on here. Right? <laughs> Listen, Matt needs to hook up. Yeah. I'm telling you. There you go. I'm telling you. Keep going, because I, I have two questions for you on, uh, on first of all, on, on, on your credentials. On yeah. your credibility. Having that kind of access to the CEOs, to the problems, to being part of the solution gives you tremendous, and this isn't a softball fluff, but I mean this, yeah. tremendous credibility in what you do. That exposure is priceless, as you know, my friend. And that's something I think that members of the audience should be looking to when they look, seek you out and say, does this guy have any credibility? Because there's so many people out there selling snake oil. Man, they ain't done, done shit, Sean. All right. Well, they're going to tell you, they're going to change the world. They're going to tell you how to do it. They're going to tell you the strategy. They never employed themselves, got their hands dirty, or tried any of the effing tactics. That's right. Yeah. That's Those people will not be on the show for long. They get a three minute hook. Right. So, but you got that credibility, having that ingress into all of those CEOs, into those freaking boardrooms, into the problem, into being able to be part of the solution that you're now exporting with those people who are able to look inward and say, I can get better because this guy can help me with strategy. And the other thing I heard you're doing is you're holding them accountable. You're measuring them. Say, what are you receiving here? What are you doing? And you're starting with that big picture. What's the purpose of the exercise? The thing that most people don't know. Why are you doing this? How, where do you want to go? What do you want to be? Now let's break it down into the steps. That's it. How do we get to I, I'm I'm actually understanding your stuff. I mean that's that that's exactly it, and and the accountability part is is something we haven't talked about, but that's, you know, that's really what differentiates us. I mean, if we take on a client, we are involved. I mean, heavily involved, because you and I both know you're immersed. You're it, immersed, totally immersed, to, totally, absolutely, completely immersed. And the accountability, if listen, if you don't have you and I have talked about this. I mean, you know. You, you've seen it a thousand different uh, ways in a thousand different places. I mean, everybody needs somebody on the outside. You and I have a lot of mutual friends who push us, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody needs somebody who can be that coach. And if you don't have that, if you don't have a systematic, um, reasonable time and place that you're meeting up with that accountability, then it probably is going to slide. You know, no, you know, and 
You talk about holding us accountable. I would love to do something with you in tandem because I think with my still relatively fast talking Northern way, <laughs> Southern style, somewhere down the middle, we could attract a whole lot of people. Okay. <laughs> Not like an Oreo cookie. You know? <laughs> what, whatever. <laughs> See, Sean, you know you're the only one taking me off my axis. <laughs> what, are, what are a few tips and, and tools you could give the audience right now? That, that would comprise or be part of a successful business enterprise? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, we started this conversation a minute ago. I mean, I believe that 100% of it is right here. Um, I had an interesting thing happen to me several years ago that gave me uh, clarity. Um, it, it, was a, it was a point of clarity in my life. And we all think we have a little bit of an idea of where it is that we want to go. Um, but for me, when, when this particular thing happened, I mean, my whole life changed and all of a sudden, uh, things that I thought were important became not so important and things that maybe I hadn't prioritized became extremely important. And I guess the thing that I would say is don't wait for a tragic or life changing situation to happen to you before you have clarity of what your purpose is because from that everything else comes. I mean, that is just it. Um, you've got to get in touch with who it is, how it is, what it is that you want to be. Otherwise, as this show implies, it's not intentional. Yes. And that's where it is that we're trying to be, you know? And, and I, yeah, I think Sean, that as I've experienced and you, you tell me what you've experienced in this, maybe you've seen some of the same where so many people are struggling to find purpose, it eludes them because they're looking too hard for it. It's something inside of you. And we tend to wrap ourselves in what we think we want to be, not, not what we really and truly are. You know, and I think that's where we get away from it. We need to take the time to find out at our core, what is at it? Our core. Who are we? Yeah, what is it? Going? That, that is absolutely it. I, I, uh, you know, for, for me, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was a 12 gauge shotgun to the head at about 40 yards in a, in a hunting accident. Your, uh, one of your viewers there was, was from Pulaski. I have a farm uh, not too far from there over in Shelbyville. And uh, long story short, um, somebody who just broke all the rules of hunter safety literally shot me in the head. And uh, oh, after about a year, I had to have several surgeries. Uh, you know, that's, I'm, I'm really not this ugly is the thing. I mean, when you, you when you look at me, you look great to me. Listen, listen, uh, you should have seen me before the surgery. I mean, I was, uh, I was right up there with people mistake me for Matt McConaughey before the surgery. It happens a lot. No, I, I, this is not funny, but I'm, I got to, I'm compelled to say it. You weren't hunting with Dick Cheney, were you? <laughs> I had to, I was there. I just, I, sorry. No. So no, no, but this is a serious thing. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I had given somebody permission to hunt on this particular land. I, I, I had come in from San Diego. I had to be, I, no, I'm sorry. I came in from New Orleans, had to be in San Diego the next day. And, uh, and I went out really just to watch the sunset. It was turkey season, you know, down here. Everybody's, everybody hunts. And uh, I don't know if I've ever told this story on camera, but, uh, but yeah, he, he broke all the rules. This guy was, was walking the edge of a field with, with the shotgun from the hip. And he heard some action and saw some movement and shot. And that movement was my head. So I, 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 took, a, I took the brunt of that on my left side and um, paralyzed my vocal cords, um, blinded me in my left eye. I couldn't hear. And I've still got, I've still got some shot in my, in my skull. <laughs> when you go through the airport, metal detectors, does it go off? You know, everybody always asks me that, and it doesn't, and I don't know why. Um, I went in for an MRI just a, a couple of years ago with a, tr a problem I was having with my elbow, and they asked me, you know, do you, have, you ever, you know, you ever had any trauma happen? And I told them I'd gotten shot, and these guys were like, "Really?" I explained the situation. They were like, "Dude, would you mind if we took an X-ray?" You know. So, so, that, you know, so they all gathered me back. They're all standing around, you know, and they took a frontal and they took a side and, and they're, oh, wow. You know, check this out. You guys look at this and they can still see the shot, you know, that's, that's still in there. But the point of that story is um, after a uh, helicopter ride to Vanderbilt medical center and a night in the trauma, 
center and surgery and all. It mm-hmm. took me 12 months to get to the point where I could talk again uh, through some just wonderful work uh, of some guys in Nashville, uh, some, some vocal cord specialists and some other things. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine and it's you know no big deal. But what came out of that for me is a serious, serious point of clarity. And up until that point, like I said, I was traveling probably 200 days a year to anybody who uh, said they wanted help and was willing to pay me. And after that, uh, things became really clear. I immediately fired about 50% of my clientele, those guys that, uh, that weren't really drinking the water. And we made a commitment that at the Crabtree Group, you know, we're going we're gonna to be really particular about who it is that we're, that we're working with. My time and the time that I was spending away from my family uh, became really important at that point. You know, you get shot in the head. And uh, I mean, listen, I'm one of those guys, you know, this is kind of a morbid story, but I'm one of those guys who, I mean, I used to think, I, you know, geez, I'm bulletproof, man. Uh, well, well you, you, you are. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, agree. <laughs> Steve, Steve Carlos reminds me of, uh, of, the, of the fact that I have shot in my head all the time. But uh, of course, that's how he feels better about himself. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna tell you said that. When you're when you're short and angry and can't smile, that what do you what do you, what do you have going for you? Really? Yeah. That's right. It's sunlight in about eight years. That's, that's, that's right. But it, it it really gave me clarity in terms of uh, who it is, how it is, what it is that we want from our business, and we became very particular about who it is that we work with moving forward. Um, and uh, you know, it's it. I mean, it was a, it was a life changer for me. It certainly. It certainly brought perspective. I don't think that, that that I've ever had, and I think that's to me. You you know, I'm going around the world to answer your original question, which is, what's a big takeaway? The big takeaway is, you know what? Listen to Sean. Don't get shot in the head before you come up with a really good, you know, you know, clarity in terms of who it is, how it is, what it is that you want to be, and what's important in life for you. And for Bill Woodich, that may be different than from Sean Crabtree, and that may be totally different than uh, Matt and some of the other viewers who are watching this. The synapses are firing more from your story than the caffeine. So I have a whole bunch of points to come back to. The first <laughs> one is if, 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 for those viewers who have never had a head wound, there's nothing that bleeds more than a head wound. Yeah, uh, that's really true. Yeah, I, I've had it. Not like you. I've had some. I've had some beauties, but not like yeah. anything close to that. And it shouldn't take an epiphany for you to get a clue and 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 start to really understand the value of you, because the value of you is in the time and where you spent the time and the people you spend the time with. People you spend the time with, and that's a really good point. And think about this, Sean. I always tell people this: that the the only people that can take away your self respect are the only way person that can give away your self respect is you. No that's one right. can take that from you. You can give that away. You got to respect your time. You got to respect your person and your product. And I think you got a great one. Well, so. I appreciate that, sir. No. You know, our, our our mantra here is that you got to get control of the things that you have the ability to control, or the things beyond your control are going to end up controlling you. And that is just you know we started this with 100 percent of, of 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 success. That's a great tweet, by the way. For you. What's that? A great tweet, by the way. Yeah, I'm going to put that out there. No, you should before I get to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey's already doing it. I can give him give him an assist. No, give him credit for that. <laughs> I don't mean to throw you off, but in a way, it's just too much fun to play with you. So I appreciate you're talking about mindset. You were you were elevating. Yeah, me. I mean, it's it's you know, it's a hundred percent of the way it is that you're thinking, and what you said is true. Um, you know, nobody has any control over your life except what you give away. Sean, and, give, give me a strategy though on this. Uh, give me, give me something on this. Sure. We all talk about mindset. We all know the importance of mindset. We can say that, but boy, it's a struggle for most. How do I get my mind right? I get all these competing fears, these 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 failures that stay logged in my my psyche. And I think you know you wrap yourself in a belief of who you are, and then the world smacks you and says, "No, you really ain't." So yeah. how, how do you get? How do you, Sean Crabtree, clear your mind and get that thing right and focused? For me personally, and for the guys that I work with, I can tell you that's a real simple answer. And that is, you got to get in touch with where you're trying to go. I believe, now we started this with my quote, right? Um, You know, you've got to control the things that are within your ability to control or the things beyond your control will end up controlling you. My belief though, is that guys like you, 
and, and guys like me understand at the deepest level, much deeper than, than, than the, what the world is smacking them with. Mm-hmm. At the deepest level, we understand that every single thing I desire somehow, some way is within my ability to control. And so all of the energy then is put into how can I versus energy spent on, you know, feeling bad about, is it possible or questioning whether or not you're capable, you know, and all of those sorts of things. I mean, you know, I I just cut a little video on this the other day, Um, you know, not to get too spiritual on you, but, but, my belief is that we were all um, created in God's image. Now, if I believe that, then why the heck am I going to question my own capability? It's there, mm-hmm. right? If I question my capability, I'm questioning my creator who made me in his image. My belief is that that is absolutely the case. Every bit of my energy then can be spent on how do I mm-hmm. versus, and that's a great question to ask, how do I? Versus can I, or is it possible? Or what do I think is possible? Or what would the world say? Or, you know, I mean, you and I deal with the, there are, there are some haters out there. Uh, You know what? People are going to. No one hates you. (laughs) Well, uh, you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but uh, I think, you know. I know you need them. They say you need them. You need them. You need them. I know. You're going to have to. No one hates them. Wait, wait. So. Sean is the real deal. Talk about laser focus and firing your clients that don't drink the Kool-Aid. Love that. That's Kenneth Stickler, and he's right on with that. Kenneth, that I appreciate that. No, I'm telling you, you you're st- you're stealing the show. You already stole it. You stole it with your accent when you said hello. <laughs> Listen, they're only- just being nice because they're your guys. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you some tremendous underscore power, and I'm smiling because of this. But what you just said about how can I and how do I it's there's a book out by a man named Daniel Pink. He's a psychologist and he talks about everybody sells. Oh, you're selling every time where you, how you get dressed, how you comport yourself. That's uh, it. Who's going to take care of the kids. Who's doing this to promote That's everything. Right. Always everybody sells. And in there, he talks about all those, those power mantras, like the Tony Robbins you mentioned before, like you can, you can do anything. You're over there. You know what? It sounds good for about one second, but Bob the builder, was an English television cartoon who asked, how, can, how do we build this? How can, and the mind searches for ways to right. make that happen. What you said right there is one of the best things I've heard from any guest on any show. And I've done a shit ton of them, including Series <laughs> Radio. So I'm kidding. Well, that, coming from I, you, my I, friend. Wow, that's great. Bring it out there to the audience because they got to ask the question, how can I? Yeah. How do I? It's in the, because the mind is going to find a way. That's right. I mean, it's been proven psychologically. You know what Chinese takeout tastes like? Tastes good. It's expensive, right? It feels good. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, that was, where'd I, what, what did I eat? So it's the same way with those positive affirmations we get, those platitudes on a piece of paper. You can be anything. Bullshit. Yeah, that's bullshit. I, I, I really do believe that's bullshit. It is I mean, bullshit. at the end of the day, at the end of the I can't day, be an astronaut, Sean. Just, just don't have it. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Oh, that's great, man. That's great. John, what led you? And and I know you had you you started out with six people and ended up, wow, your company is just this blow up of six hundred and seventy-five thousand people, of which I hope you had some good stock options. But what led you into entrepreneurship? Is this is this something inside you that said, I always want to be this, I want to see how good I really am as an entrepreneur, or is it there's a whole lot of money in this? Or the combination of the two. You know, nobody's ever asked me that question. Uh, in the, well, I'm in the, Bill Woodich and they're not. And th- there you go. I mean, that's why you're the man. Uh, no, that's a good question. I, I, I think for me, honestly, um, I wanted the test. If I'm going to fail, uh, if I'm going to win, I want it to be because I made the decision. And I don't want that to be up to anybody else. And when I was working with somebody else, you know, I, I, I interviewed um, – uh, Matt Monero recently, and I and I threw a stat at him. Love him. That, by the that, way. Yeah, I love Matt. Yeah, and I threw a stat at him. I said, you know, you know, only eight percent of the population in the U.S. is entrepreneurs, and he goes, "That's too many. It's too many." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "It's just it's too hard. There's too many ups and too many downs." For me, so what he's saying is, there's a lot of people who are are business people who own a company, but are not truly in the truest, strictest definition. An entrepreneur. And I believe that's because they're not willing to look inward. 
Um, I, I look at the whole thing as a game, man. I really do. It's a fun, fun game. I want to jump out there and I want to make decisions. And I realize that those decisions are going to move me forward or they're going to take me backwards. And I love, I just love that tussle of the whole thing. And of course, when it, when, you know, when you make decisions that are working well, you, uh, you know, you have the, 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 the confidence that comes from the fact that you did something and it worked well. And when you screw it up, which we all do, then I have just learned a valuable lesson that I can put into my pocket along with those other lessons that are going to have me be better off right. moving forward. You know, there's, there's, there's three things to this. And I, what you just said about wanting to, needing to see how good you are, how good you were. I worked for some big companies. One was Fortune 500, became their top salesperson. There was another one that was the sixth largest in the world and became their top salesperson two years in a row. And I always thought, is it because of the brand? Or is it me? Uh, or is it me? Right. I, I, I couldn't go to my grave without knowing. And you're never going to know, right, unless you jump out. And I yeah. didn't want to sit on that park bench of regret that I call it and think back and say, you know, I didn't do it. And now look at you. You've yeah. answered the I'm question. The best, I'm the second best uh, dressed guy in the show. Get, <laughs> get out of here, man. You, listen, you are, you are the man. I mean, my tailor's coming here at 10 o'clock, and, he's, and my, my, you just made my bill go up. And you also mentioned this, and I think it's very important to get this as part of your mindset, is the game. I teach and preach in here and coach and conjole that this is a freaking game, man. It's yeah. a game. You know, we're not dealing in life and death issues. You know, we're not taking the brunt of a shotgun at 40 feet, you know? <laughs> but we're, no, we're, we are in a game here. And if you ascribe, Sean, your value on today's win, today's sale, and tomorrow you'll lose one, you got to go up and down based on those things that you say are outside of your control and they will take over and control you. I, I, what you said, no, 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 no. What you said is, is really important. I mean, if you base your value on those, right. Mm -hmm. And, and I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, your value has nothing to do with those kinds of things. However, right. I also believe that if I didn't get a win, I can't point the finger at somebody or something. Okay. So my value is not based on that, but if I didn't win it, there's something somehow, some way that I could have been different. Where's the lesson? Where's the thing I can do? What can I take away? Yeah. And then no matter what the, no matter what the situation was, um, there's value to me. And now I'm stronger for it because I take that along with the other chinks in my armor and I go back into battle much, uh, much stronger. We have one non-negotiable in this company. Besides ethics, we have one non-negotiable. No excuses. I don't need excuses. I just need to know how we get to the root of things, fix it, make it better, or learn from it. I don't need your freaking excuses. Dog ate your homework. Don't really care. Right. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, take personal ownership for it. There's something we could have seen, didn't see, should have seen. Maybe we couldn't see it. Whatever it is, let's learn from it. Let's move forward. Everything else is just a waste of time. Just That's it. And we, we put that in place, man. We put that in place with everything we do. Um, my business partner and I, we just, just uh, came in from Atlanta late last night. And that's the first thing that we said, you know, okay, what's the, what's the thing that didn't work? What's the thing we can learn from? What's the thing that did work? And then we celebrate that. And that's just who we are. That's the identity of who we are on a regular basis. And that's what well, we implement in the client. If, if business, Sean, is a game, we need to get in play. We need to play it forward with strategy. That's part of the thing that the, the Crabtree group can help us. And we need to have that mindset right before we do any of it. We need to know who it is we intend to become. And then we have to, have to do those things that help us become that. And we have to ask those questions. How can I? How do I? That's it. And control those things we can control before those things that we can't control start to control us. That's exactly right. Close? Okay. I'm going to ask you a tough question because uh -oh. I was this on Fox Business by the head of Fox Business and I screwed it up. I didn't screw it up, but I kind of waffled around it, which is screwing it up. How do you define if 8% if 8% of the population, which is, man, it's about 30 million, right? 8% of the population are entrepreneurs. How do you define an entrepreneur versus a, a business person who owns a company? What's the difference between an entrepreneur and a business? I know they asked me that. <laughs> wow, that's a great question, man. I'd love to know your answer for that after mine. But I, you know, you're asking me the question. I mean, for me, I think a, a business person could mean a whole bunch of different things. I think of a, I think of a, 
you know, my definition of a business person, I think more of a, uh, a tactical um, implementer. A business person can work for any business. When I think of an entrepreneur, I think of somebody out there hustling, man. They're, they're scratching. It's all them. Um, it's all theirs. They are looking for the responsibility where when I think of a business person, I think of a lot of times uh, a middle manager. Not that I'm, and there's nothing wrong with a middle manager. Um, but I just distinguish the two in those ways. Except for um, overhead. <laughs> except for overhead. Yeah, there you go. That's you right. Be I mean, performing. You better be performing. If you're in middle management, you better be right. picking some ass, not, not hiding with a closed door. And the entrepreneur is the guy who is paying that middle manager. Or, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, a business person kind of gets a paycheck. An entrepreneur may or may not, depending on what. How did you answer that? Okay, I'm going to break it down real simple, and and, and he was buying some of this. Okay. He, he, he was looking more on the Elon Musk, uh, more. He, I think he was confusing innovation with being wow. an entrepreneur. And I think if your daily bread depends upon your activity or lack thereof, you're an entrepreneur. If yeah. you're out there, and each of us in a company are intrapreneurs who, who work for a company. That's right. The entrepreneur, everything, your house, you know, you're, there's no net, John. You're it's on fire, you. man. So he said, you tell me the mom and pop down the street, they're entrepreneurs. That was a question. I said, yeah, they are. If, if there's no other finite source of income other than what they do, and the bank might loan something, take the house if they don't do it. But your success and your future is dependent upon your skill, and you're out there on your own creating something. I mean, With no awesome. net. No, no freaking net, baby. Yeah, that's it. it. And, you know, most of us confuse an intrapreneur, which is a great place to look at a, uh, inside the company as an employee. I am an intrapreneur, able to create and, and, and earn my way to autonomy, where I can influence my destiny by the things I do today. It's on me. It's not on them to do it for me. That's just right. freaking accountability at yep. a top point. Now you get me all fired up. Get me all fired up. No, I mean that you know what you say is true. I mean, I think I think I think one of the definitions of an entrepreneur is at the end of the day, there's no net and the accountability is coming from within yeah. uh, more than anything else. Hey, if those people that are that are own that little bread store, the bakery, if they don't if they don't sell bread, man, they don't exist. And you know what I tell people in here? Hey, we in the corporate insurance part of this arm, right? It, it, you've got to actually be able to till the fields. You gotta be able to plant the crop. You better do the rain dance. If you can't, you better find a way to irrigate. That's you better right. hope the crop grows. You gotta take it and you gotta sell it. So you're, you, that's up to you. And that starts with the genesis of that kernel of thought that has everything to do with mindset. Then they hire someone like you, to teach them how to sell it for more, right? That's so, it. Awkward segue, but I was working it. So <laughs> no, that's a good segue. Where does the, because they're avid, they're blowing up my screen. Where does the avid listener say, okay, this guy's got the accent, it's got the substance, man, he even took a bullet or, or eight. Um, how, how pellets, how do, I know because I was in Western PA, I, I used to shoot skeet and stuff like that. Um, and, I was, and there was a lot of hunting accidents where I grew up, so it's crazy, even though people wear orange. So tell me where we find you. We can be found almost anywhere, man. Um, you can Google me. Um, but you can find me at the crabtreegroup.com. And from there you can connect, you know, hit the YouTube and, and follow us. Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, all of that. And we're putting out content, man, like you are on a regular basis. You know, we, we put stuff out there five, six times a week, all the time, all the time. Well, I'm going to hit you on something that I just, just came across my, <laughs> came across just <laughs> i know you know you never know where i'm going do you I'm like uh-oh he's gonna open that keep me on my toes here i got no idea what you're about to hear you know, I, I think we share this i think we start to become a value when I, for me sean it was this I, I had this tremendous need when i was young to be liked yep. and and then as i evolved i remember an attorney asking me he said would you still jump off a building for your clients to be liked and i said no I know it's not as important for me to be liked. What's important though, is for me to be appreciated. And if they don't appreciate me, I'm, I'm going to go another, another direction. We had a $100,000 account, $100,000 to us. So it's a commission account. And he did some things after eight years that showed me he didn't appreciate us. So I said, we resign. We fire ourselves. No, 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 don't do that. Came back, changed the behavior. 
and kept us. Unless you value your proposition and are able to walk away from positions like that, you're always going to be used. You don't know you have the scissors, you can cut the string because the puppet master is that other person. Tell me someone like that that you fired, they went away, they didn't go away, whatever it is, and how you did it. Well, you know, um, you're right, man. You're, you're hitting me with stuff out of left field here. Um, let's see. I had... Uh, you're handling everything so deftly. I think you're a second baseman for the Yankees, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're moving, man. You're like Jeter in the day. Come on. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I, had, I had some clients that, uh, like I said, I mean, I got rid of 50% of my client base. Um, because I, I, I learned how'd you do that and not worry about the, or if you did worry, I don't worry is a weak word. How'd you do that and keep the income? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, we haven't, you and I haven't talked about this, but, um, I mean, I know financial, financial freedom is, is some of the things that you guys talk about, uh, on the unstoppables for me, uh, listen, there's, you know, this is coming out of nowhere. There's a great movie. I think it was Mark, Mark Wahlberg. And it was a remake uh, of an older movie. I think it's called The Gambler. Did you ever see that movie? Do you know what I'm talking about? The Gambler? Yeah. Oh, you got it. Listen. Kenny Rogers? Listen. When we get, listen, yeah, you got it. Around the country somehow? <laughs> what, what the hell? John Goodman plays a, a, a loan shark. Oh, 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 oh. I saw it. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. He was, he was a teacher. And there's Walter, a Walter was a teacher, correct? Walter was a teacher. And he was a gambler. And so he had, he, he, he gambled away all his money and long and the short of it is he'd already exhausted every loan shark in the area and he's got to go to the last one, which is John Goodman. And, and, and Goodman asked him a question. Now he's, he knows he's got the leverage, right? This mm -hmm. kid needs money. Nobody yeah. else is loaning him anything. And by the way, they're all trying to kill him. And, and, and he basically says, you know, he, he John Goodman turns to him and says, so what's the biggest you've ever been up? At the, at, the, at the poker table. He goes, I heard it was a million. And, and, and Wahlberg says it was two. And he goes, every, every idiot knows that when you're up two million, you walk away. You go invest your money. You know, and he basically says, that's called the fuck you position. Mm -hmm. That's what he talks about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, maybe, maybe not in that language, but, but that's the way I look at it. I embrace um, that language. <laughs> it's an R-rated show. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> but that's the way I look at it. I mean, I, I've never, you know, the, the one thing that I have to be able to control is my, my only wealth building tool, which is my income. So I'm never in a position ever under any circumstances as a business owner, as a father, as a husband, I am never in a position where I'm overextended. And that puts me in a position where I am in control. If I give up that position, I am no longer in control. Somebody else is. So that was how I did it. I mean, it, it, it's for me, it wasn't about the money anyway. It was about, you know, the kick in the pants that I was getting, but these guys weren't implementing it. So I just let them go. I mean, one of those, one of those clients was somebody that I, I really, really liked and, uh, and we were close, but uh, it, it, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't beneficial. The relationship wasn't beneficial. She was taking advantage of the relationship, but she wasn't implementing the things that could get her to the place where she was moving forward. She wasn't drinking the water. So I was no longer willing to give everything that I have for this relationship that, uh, now, you know, the, a great question that you're probably going to ask is, well, what if, what if she had turned and started implementing the things? You know what? I probably would stay with her. I wasn't going to ask that, but, but I like the way you're starting to uh, circumvent now. And you start <laughs> so you get the first hit. The I'm try, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm trying to you're do. You're offensive now. Now you, now you got the ball. Let, so I don't let, have to play defense. So let right. me give you one you're going to love. Okay. Two, two types of water. We, we're talking about the same thing. But I'll give you a water one people love around here. right? Well, like the ones that are still here love. One is that, you, you got, yeah, you got to drink the Kool-Aid. Right? Yeah, to a degree, you have to drink the Kool-Aid. You have to believe right. in who we are as a paladin, determined advocate. You have to live that to a degree to but agree the thing about the water i always said is that my job as ceo and the other in, in any company i have or that i'm a ceo in is to be able to pull those dead cows out of that water stream because the dead cows are the venomous the the victims by choice right who are going to pollute for the young That's minds right. hearts they're going to pollute the stream man You've got to carry those cattle out of the freaking stream. And I'm going to tell you something that I don't want to be lost. This is another show. 
but you nailed this because like seeks like, and I agree with you on this 120%, there's too much bad information going out there. And some of it from beacons on social media, which is a real issue. I am debt averse. I'll say it again. I am debt averse. I sleep well, don't owe on anything, house paid off, work toward that. So for me, that's my fuck you position. Exactly. And there are so many people espousing, get in the debt, get in the debt, borrow more, spend more, do more. You know what? I can't. It's hard to sleep with that sword of Damocles hanging over my head. It would be really, really hard. So I'm not advocating for anyone to take my road, your road, or Grant Cardone's road. But find the road that's right for you once you know what it is you want and be able to support and cash those promises because you don't want the bank taking things away from you. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, th there are a lot of, there are a lot of people out there in my opinion that are, that are shysters on, uh, on social media. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I wonder sometimes if the cars and the houses and all, I wonder if they're not rented. They're not theirs. I don't think. I've had people ask me to get in front of mine. Yeah. I know they're not theirs because they want to show this fucking image. This is who I think I am. Yeah. What a bunch of shit. <laughs> I mean, really? But people, I mean, yeah. but, 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 but they're buying it. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a desire for people to want a, uh, a quick fix. And you know what? It four doesn't hour body, exist. Four hour this, four hour yeah. that. It, it doesn't exist. I mean, what you mentioned is, you know, if you, if you are, if you are debt averse, okay. One component of that is being able to put your head down on the pillow. A whole nother component of that is, you know what? If you are making, if you are not in control of your income and somebody else or some other thing is, then you lose the ability to make clear headed decisions. Ooh, yes. And you're, gonna, and you're gonna end up making decisions in ways that are not supportive of who it is, how it is, what it is, and where it is that you wanna be. They're made for the wrong, from the wrong basis. They're made because you have a debt scenario that you have to serve. Um, and I just, I, I've never been that way. I'm like you, I pay cash for vehicles. Um, you know, I don't owe uh, anybody a dime. I don't, uh, I don't owe anything on my house. And that puts you in a position to be very committed. Anything. That's <laughs> absolutely right, man. That's absolutely right. And I wonder, you know, some of these guys out there, you know, you see the Lambos and all that. Listen, if you see through the Lambo, it's because I paid cash for that sucker. Right. Right. Sean, something you said about decision making, which is a huge takeaway for the audience. You're down in the instinct part of your brain trying to survive when you have all that other debt. Right. You're, you're, who's the master in the, in, the, in the whole thing? It's the, right? it's the bank. So it's you're exactly. operating out of that fear-based instinct, which clouds the judgment because no thought, no real cognitive rational thought can occur because you're stuck in the base of your brain. That's, that's right. instinct survival, baby. And yeah, you're choking. Yeah. You know, you got, that's why I got to take this tie off. You got to get to the top part of your brain, start asking those questions. And I'm, I'm going to give you this too. You know this because you, you, you sounds like you've lived this. There's two forms of capital. There's your emotional capital and there's the real capital, the real yeah. money. Uh, you know, and, and I yeah. don't want to expend emotional capital on those people, those 50%, 20%, 10% that aren't going to be drinking the Kool-Aid, that aren't going to be furthering the brand, that aren't going to be doing things right. from a standpoint of personal responsibility. Man, I think we're in the same place there. Yeah, and you got to be willing to cut them loose, man, because they're not serving where it is that you're trying to go. It's the hardest thing, but you do. And, you know, here's the thing. When did everyone, I don't know how much you sleep, so I'm going to just throw this without knowing if the glove fits, right? Okay. But, but when did everybody start sleeping four hours a night? <laughs> Do we have like the living dead, the, like a bunch of walking zombies around here? Everybody got four hours. Oh, I made it on two. Oh, Jesus. I mean, you, uh, come on. <laughs> you, you know, I, when did everybody start buying that? The same people that start buying, the, that's, yeah, that's his Lambo. And that's his yacht. And that's his thing. Come on, man. That's not me. I mean, you're in the gym every morning, right? We're in the gym every afternoon. Every afternoon. Okay. I'm a morning guy. So listen, if I don't get, if I'm older than you, so I'm too creaky to be a morning guy. <laughs> You're not older than me. Look at you. You look, you look 10 years younger than uh, me. It's just the Vaseline we have over the lens. <laughs> hey, Sean, talk to me about financial freedom and I want to get into it this way. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, the show just went to shit. The hand that's stop it here. Sean, financial, <laughs> financial freedom. 
really Warren Beatty and those people they used to put lenses out that's that <laughs> soft and all of a sudden you couldn't tell if it was Warren Beatty or not because it was like it's a blob so um, <laughs> financial freedom start with this and I start here what's the purpose of the exercise meaning why are we doing this thing you know this game called life really yeah what are we doing this for but how do you describe and, and how do you move toward financial freedom well, first of all, I think you have to define it, right? I think you have to define what financial freedom is for you. Um, this, is a, this is an exercise that I uh, put my clients through all the time before we start working together. Why did you get into this business? And I get all of these things that are not measurable. You know, I got, you know, because I, you know, I want to help people or whatever. You can't measure that stuff, right? right? I mean, it's great to help people, but how do you know when you're done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all the qualitative, subjective stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I think you have to, you know, I think you have to define what is financial freedom. That's that's step one. And what does it mean for you? Uh, and I can only tell you that for me, financial freedom means I am in a position where I am not beholden to anybody for anything, and I can have what I want when I want it, um, without the fear of. I mean, if I, you know. Listen, if I have to go borrow money, then I probably don't want it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the real truth of the matter and the way I look at it. But financial freedom, the definition is, I can get whatever I want, whenever I want, mm -hmm. you know, without being beholden to anybody. So the next question is, how do you get there? Number one, you got to get control of what's going on right there, right? You got to make decisions that are moving you. If that is where you want to go, you got to make decisions that are serving that place that you're trying to go. And that sounds like a small thing when you say it fast, but there are a lot of guys out there who are making decisions that are not attached to that. And they got all these things going on and, and, and they all these, all these different masters that they're trying to serve. Um, so, you know, for me, it's, it's really about getting control of what's going on right here, having the clarity of that purpose, and then making those decisions that serve that place. Okay. Did you come got to get control of what's Did you come from a trust fund family? Oh, hell no. Yeah. And that's my point because neither did I. And this is what I don't want the audience to miss. No one backed up the Brinks truck and gave us money. So everything you're saying about that mindset and where we are now in a position we've earned to be able to make those choices for financial freedom is because we did the effing work. That's right. We, we, we built our value. Other people realized our value and they freaking paid us for it. And the That's ones right. that didn't, didn't realize our value. We move on. You move on. So I, I don't want people to lose that. Yeah, people think, yeah, there's Bill and Sean, man. Hey, they dress nice. Look at them now. Yeah, yeah, bullshit, man. Oh, that's totally I bullshit. Out and I made $15,000 a year in my first job in sales. That was, that was it. You know, that's I had a, you know, my mom gave me an oxidized brown station wagon with no hubcaps. I couldn't even tie a tie. You should have seen the way I dressed then. It was the same corduroy suit, light tan, every effing day. Because <laughs> they were sorry. They felt sorry for me. <laughs> You'll have to pay for one of my talks. I'll probably give you backstage anyway for free to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> the same. <laughs> I no, but that, that's true, man. I mean, everything I mean, is totally yeah. true. Unless they backed the brakes truck up, you know. Yeah, so no, I mean, no. I only had one way. That was always forward. I had to burn my boat, cross the Rubicon, kick myself in the ass, and be accountable. Because if I didn't do it, there wasn't anybody else going to do it for me. And I, and I think that's a. You know what? At, at some point, if you're going to be successful in life, you've got to have a realization moment that what mm -hmm. you just said is totally true. Yeah. At the end of the day. It's all me. Yes. I mean, mama ain't coming. Nobody's going to rescue me. You yes. know, and, and, and in, in, in the words of uh, that great philosopher, Kenny Chesney, I mean, when you run out of sand, man, you can't flip it over and start again. That's just the bottom line. You got one shot. I'm just trying to catch that one, but that went way over my head. That you and I, I knew you'd come back into some kind of country. Kenny Chesney, man, listen, he's I know. Deep. I, I need he's to deep, Bill. You got. Hey, I'll, I'll give you an easy one. Does he wear a hat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you one coin. There's two sides to it, so I'm going to give you two parts. The first okay. part is how does Sean Crabtree define success? Smoke. That's tough. Yeah. yeah and what's the other one? Oh, I got to go. I got to go one at a time. Uh, no, I'll give you two. You're able to, you're, you're able to handle two. The other one is, is what, how, what's your biggest failure and how'd you come through it? 
Ooh, that's even tougher. So how do I define success? Um, I think success for me is when you attain where you want to be. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, if you want, uh, if you want $12 million in the bank, uh, and you want the Lambo, uh, when you attain it, you're successful. Uh, whatever it is that's less than that, that you may want. If you attain it, when you attain it, you're successful. We're, we're kindred souls because to me, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I always thought success was the, the really the, ex, the realization of my own expectation. And that's what you're saying. It's the realization of whatever your expectation is. Streets, if you want to be a street sweeper, be the best one. I mean, uh, that's the realization of your own expectation. Well, and that, that was a tough one for me because when I was a kid, I, uh, I mean, it was all about the dollar, man. When I was, when I was a young guy, I thought success was dollars yeah. and I chased it, man, hard for a lot of years um, until, uh, you know, until the realization hit. Mm -hmm. So that's for me. So what is the biggest disappointment I've had in life? No, no, your, your, your defining moment, that one moment, Pam, and you might've already touched this, but that moment where you went boom and it changed the trajectory, the arc of your entire life and career. What's, what's your deep one, def, one, you only get one, Sean, your one defining moment. Part of that you asked was what was my biggest regret, right? Go ahead. And then what's the defining moment of that? Um, you know, and, 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 and Bill, you're getting, you, you, you're hitting me hard here, man. You're hitting me really deep. Uh, I'll just be honest with you. One of the on biggest, calls, you can go on Lewis Howe's show. That's exactly right, man. You're, you're, you're throwing the real stuff here. The biggest re regret that I have, and it's something that I will never be able to do something about is, uh, I have one child and I wish I had six. Um, I, in the early part of my life, I was traveling all over the place. I'm a, I have a lovely wife who have been married for 24 years this year. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. We had a lot of, we had a lot of good times, but we put off having kids, frankly, because I was too damn selfish is what it boils down to. I was chasing um, my dream. It was a big mistake. Yes. It was a very, very big mistake. I wish I had six kids now. That was a huge, huge mistake. Um, now, to the other point, what was my real defining moment? It was absolutely when I got shot in the head. And uh, about three months after that happened, or shortly thereafter, um, I got my wife pregnant. And I'm not sure that we would have. I'm not sure that we would have done that if I hadn't had that clarity of purpose. Listen, I had, I had a lot of clarity, man. When I, when I got shot in the head, I got my pilot's license. I ran my first marathon. I did that within 12 months of getting shot in the head, which was interesting because my vocal cords were still paralyzed. So I was training for a marathon with my vocal cords in a, in a relaxed state, yes. which meant that when I breathed hard, I sounded like a freight train, but, uh, but yeah, so I ran my first marathon, got my pilot's license all immediately uh, within 12 months of, of getting shot in the head, um, built my dream house and, uh, and got it paid for and, uh, and got my wife pregnant all uh, within a very short time after that. It was a defining moment in my life when, uh, when the things that are most important really came home to me. And frankly, I don't know where I would be if I hadn't got shot in the head. I'm really appreciative for that. He's literally bulletproof, got a crystal clear vision of his business goals. He's willing to get rid of those people who don't appreciate him, that don't reflect his vision. He has directed and intentional activity. His name is Sean Crabtree. Not only that, he dressed as well, and we got to love his voice. He's literally bulletproof. I got more for you. You're not getting away yet. Okay. What's next for you? So now you're raising the bar. You're doing the stuff in media. You know, what is driving you at that to get to that next level? What is it? What's next for you? You know, I mean, I, th I think in the short term, um, it, 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 it's amazing because I've been doing this for a little over 20 years, but I'm still relatively unknown. And so part of what I'm trying to do in the media. Right after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Not after the shit we've been laying down. There's some tracks out here, baby. Some heavy tracks, man. <laughs> Listen, man, you <laughs> after you being shot, you little leave with that shot in the head, you're gonna go go viral. <laughs> By the way, I don't I don't mean to digress on this, but I'm I'm going to. It, uh, are you writing or in the process of writing a book? I am, as a matter of fact. Um, like, unsolicited coaching. Start with that story. 
What's that? Unsolicited coaching. Start with that story. Unsolicited coaching. I'm, I'm not My following. unsolicited coaching is this. I, you, I'm coaching you on this with you. you know oh, okay. But, All right. but no, start with the story. Start with that story. Paint those fields. Paint what really happened to change your life and start there. You'll catch them and you, the rest of it, man, you're, you got, that is a, that's unsolicited. You didn't ask for it. Well, I appreciate that. Bill. And, and you know what? I, I, I respect your opinion and I, and I heed your advice. You know, you sent me a copy of your book uh, not too long ago with a very nice note challenging me. And, uh, and I appreciate that very much. You didn't have to do that. Because I, I liked you. I even like you more now. Well, I- <laughs> you can listen to Sean on Growth Profits on the thewoodichnetwork.com, W-O-O-D-I-T-C-H.com. Where else can we find you? Thecrabtreegroup.com. Click on the YouTube button so that every, every bit of content we put out goes right to your inbox. Sadly, we must go away. But before we do... Comes the most important to me question of the day. Are you serious? How could you, you, you there's another hard ball you're throwing at me here. <laughs> no, it's like a beach ball. Ooh, okay. Ooh, here okay. it is. All right. I'm big on this, Sean. I think that if we pass away and we haven't shared, we haven't mentored, we haven't left legacy that for other people to learn from, to grow from, they really, we've, you know, we've probably had some ill spent life, selfish life, like both of us. You- have- both of us have you you epitomize that my friend well we both had it i mean both of us were selfish i woke up one day i was 40 and i went oh my god is this all there is because it was always a chase for the dollars and, and so we're, we're similar but if you were going to write one paragraph i don't care how long it is one paragraph for people to learn from sean's experiences sean's guiding principles what you'd want people if you were no longer on this earth we all know you're going to live to 120 because you're bulletproof <laughs> what would you write in that paragraph for your kid to read for other people to read the first thing that comes to my mind is number one, forget what people around you are telling you is possible. Number two, tie into exactly who it is, how it is, and what it is that you want to be. And number three, don't let anything stand in your way of getting there. When you talk to old guys like you and I, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. When you talk to old guys like me, I mean, look at this. Look at the look at the gray hair. You got none of that, man. So, you know, when you, when you talk to an old guy like me, uh, there are lessons that can be learned. And at the end of the day, uh, anybody that you talk to, their regrets are always, always that I didn't go for fill in the blank when I should have or I could have. And at the end of the day, you know what? It is a game. Let the record show that you, that you struck out, that you hit the ball, that you walked. But if it shows that you sat on the bench, yeah. what kind of life is it? Get in, get in there and be a participant. Don't be an observer. And by the way, you, you can ask Steve Carlos. I don't die this shit. You'll find, the, <laughs> you'll find the gray in there, okay? You just haven't looked hard <laughs> enough. It's in there, okay? Uh, but I'd like to go like you and look kind of like the George Clooney. You actually look younger than, a lot like younger than George Clooney. But you got that kind of look. You know, I hate to let you go. I want to get you back on here. I mean that. You were a phenomenal in every sense of the word. Phenomenal. Coming, listen, yeah. coming from you, Bill, that is, that is a hell of a compliment, my hey, friend. You, I, you, I taught me a, you taught me a lot today. And I want to make sure we get this out there, break some of it up, and make sure other people get it too. You are um, very kind. Thank you, Bill. Are you a fantastic man? Hey, st- st- stick on for a minute while we cut off all my rambling here, okay? We'll do it. See you guys. Thanks a lot for joining. It was awesome.